coming to you with. Uh, it's not streaming yet, Aru. It's starting now. Yeah, it's not up yet, Baba Moses. Okay. It's not streaming yet, Aru. It's okay. starting now. It's up now. Yeah, it's not up yet, Baba Moses. Okay, got it. All right. Uh, greetings again, all greetings. Uh, you are you are on Freedom Friday Forum of uh, February eleventh, two thousand twenty-two. Coming to you from the Woodson Banneker Jackson Bay Division, UNIA CLRC twenty twenty in Washington D.C. And uh, tonight we have uh, a program with uh, Baba Senghor Baye, this the first assistant president general, and uh, Peter Bailey, veteran, uh, <coughs> a veteran. Uh, I was saying reporter, but journalist, veteran journalist, and uh, and confidant of. Uh, uh, Malcolm X, uh, and we are going to open up this being a program sponsored by the UNIHCL RC2020. We got a couple of things that we have to do when we are opening up sessions like this. Uh, one of which is doing our official pledge to the flag, the RBG, red, black, and green flag that was brought to you by the UNIACL year 1920, over 100 years ago. It's the African people's flag. It's the flag of the UNIA. And uh, I want you to know that. Okay, I commit my body, mind, and spirit to the protection, defense, and security of the red, black, and green. I dedicate my life to the redemption of Mother Africa and the liberation of her scattered black children. I accept for myself and my descendants the teachings of universal African nationalism, and I promise that our children will be instilled with the purpose and knowledge of themselves as African people in order that the cause of our struggle will neither falter nor fail until all black people are free and united through one God, one aim, God. One, one destiny. Aim. One destiny. Yes. Uh, PG, uh, we, you don't need to repeat it. It becomes kind of seconds late. And um, it, mm -hmm. and it doesn't move smoothly, but we do appreciate you for <laughs> wanting to come through with that. Um, now, let me do this other part, this other part of our pro protocol, which is uh, reciting to you the preamble of the constitution of the UNIACL, for, for which uh, you will know exactly what the UNIACL is all about. As our ancestors put this together, it's because they want you to know who we are and what we are about. The Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League is a social, friendly, humanitarian, charitable, educational, institutional, constructive and expansive society and is founded by persons desiring to the utmost to work for the general uplift of the Negro peoples of the world. And the members pledge themselves to do all in their power to conserve the rights of their noble people and to respect the rights of all mankind, believing always in the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God. The motto of the organization is our God of I'm sorry, one God, one aim, one destiny. Therefore, let justice be done to all mankind, realizing that if the strong oppresses the weak, confusion and discontent will ever mark the path of man, but with love, faith, and charity towards all, the reign of peace and plenty will be heralded into the world, and the generations of men <coughs> shall be called blessed. That's the preamble. And with that, uh, we will move on to our discussion and uh, presentations. So I will turn this now over to our 
first assistant president general Senghor Baye to do the introduction. Yeah, thank you, Baba Mosi. And I'd like to say greetings to everybody this February uh, 2022. I'm gonna be very brief and then I'm gonna bring on uh, our elder, uh, honorable A. Peter Bailey. But I wanna lay some groundwork because if those who saw our flyer, we, we, we study our story all the time. Dr. Carter G. Woodson's original intent was for us to learn more about our history, heritage, and culture, not just American Africans, but African heritage and its proof. And real briefly, we're also talking about uh, Brother Malcolm X. We're going to show the connections because Brother Malcolm and Garvey and Woodson, by the way, Asala in 2000, I mean, I'm sorry, in 1915. And the UNIA in 1914 were established as institutions that are still standing today. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but we want to make sure that people are real clear that we must know ourselves. And I want to share some brief things that Marcus Garvey said. Uh, we're going to talk about him a lot more this month uh, when the President General and myself are going to talk specifically about the UNIA. But Garvey said a people without knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. He also said, this is another quote, liberate the minds of men and ultimately you will liberate the bodies of men. And then he also said, God and nature first made us what we are and then out of our own creative genius, we make ourselves what we want to be. Follow always that great law. And that's a universal law, by the way, not a man-made law. Let the sky and God be our limit and eternity our measurement. Those words from the right excellent honorable Marcus Mosai Garvey make it real clear. Garvey was serious about us studying our history in Africa and certainly here. And it's no coincidence that the institution that Dr. Woodson started, started one year after the UNIA was, was incorporated in Jamaica. And in Chicago, mm -hmm. Dr. Woodson was taking on a lot of white historians, him and some other African historians, and he decided to establish a lot of institutions. So real quickly, one that most people are familiar with, a book, The Miseducation of the Negro, is critical. If you read this book, you will really understand why it's important for us to study our history and to know ourselves. But he also, and he did that book, by the way, that book was done in a very critical year. It was copywritten in 1933, but prior to that, it was published in the Negro world of the right excellent honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey and the UNIA. We don't see that as no coincidence. It's very serious. But also in 1928, before then, he did a book called The Negro Makers of History. And he's not just talking about history in the United States. He's talking about history all around the world and Africa. And it's also very important to know that as a ray of light, I happen to be a ray of light that was chosen with, you know, Tony Browder, Dick Gregory, Ayana Gregory, and a lot of other people with Asala. And I love Asala because our division, the Woodson Banneker Jackson Bay Division is named after Woodson. But this book, which is not necessarily on the market, was a gift to all of us. And it's called Carter G. Woodson's Appeal. And it has some very striking things that I shared with Renoko Rashidi so that we could see that, that, that Carter G. Woodson was about us studying our history all the way back to ancient Africa. And it's a lot in this book that proves that. And you know, also Negro History Week in 1926 was a strategy to get us more focused on studying our history so that Africans in the United States could become more clear of their roots and culture. I'm in a meeting. And so uh, can you mute yourself, Congo? And so in 1926, it was called Negro History Week, but also he published Negro History Bulletins. And he also published, thanks to being ad advised by uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, bulletins, both Negro History Bulletins and then later became Black History Bulletins. They went in schools. So Dr. Woodson was about publishing and putting information in schools because he saw the miseducation taking place. So in closing, brothers and sisters, I want to make it clear, just this opening, 
before I bring on my brother, Peter Bailey, who's going to talk a lot about Malcolm and whatever else he wants to talk about, because he actually did not just study Malcolm. He walked with Malcolm. He worked with Malcolm. In fact, he was a journalist with Malcolm, and he will explain all of that. But the Association of Study of Negro Life and History was the original name. Now, listen to that. The Association of Study of Negro Life and History. It didn't say anything about the United States. It says the Association of Study for the Study of Negro Life and History. And I think sometimes we get confused and we get caught up in celebrating great people. Don't get me wrong. It's great when Blacks do anything. But we get caught up in celebrating athletes, entertainers, and things of that nature. And we forget about those brothers and sisters like Dr. Clark, Doc Ben, Nanny Helen Burroughs. It's just so many we can name. Those are brothers and sisters who, who laid the black print for us to follow. So without any further ado, we're going to get into it. But today, of course, Asala is named a little different than what it was when Carter G. Woodson came along. But we're going to talk a little bit about that on the other side. But without any further ado, I'm honored to bring to you not only Elder Bailey, who, who served as the president for Asala and also, like I say, work with Malcolm and also is one of the major people of, fit, of thought behind the PAFM being established, the Pan-African Federalist Movement. And I don't think a lot of y'all may know that, but now you do. In fact, it was in Peter Bailey's house where Brother Jumai met with our brother Cliff and they came up with the complete name. But I won't get too into that until later. But without any further ado, Elder Bailey, thank you so much for taking time out and joining us. Uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself that I didn't share that you want us to know. And then also get right into it because you've done several books on Malcolm. You're doing, all, doing one now. But more importantly, you knew the family and you were in the Audubon Ballroom, I believe, when they took our brother away. Brother Bailey. First of all, I wanna, I wanna thank you for inviting me to participate in this program. Uh, and and, and know, let you know right away that I am a serious history buff. And uh, I became one well, at Howard University, which I entered when I was 20 years old after being three years in the American military. And I ran into Dr. Harold Lewis. And on the first day of class, Dr. Lewis said to us, all your life you studied the history of people of a European descent. In this class, you're gonna study the history of the rest of the people in the world. And it was in that class in 1950, 1960, that I was introduced to African history, uh, African-American history, uh, some Native American history, some Jap Japanese history, and some Chinese history, but mainly African history and, and the history of people of African descent in North America. So, um, and from then on, uh, I became a, a history buff. And, and one of the things that, that attracted me uh, to Brother Malcolm when I first heard him speak was that he talked about history. That was a part of his, of his conversation uh, uh, at that time. Uh, in that first speech that I heard him give in Harlem in, in June of 1964. And uh, one of the things he talked about was the importance of history. And he also, and the other thing, which is I had practically never heard anyone talk about it, at least in, in the way that he did. Of course, you know, Dr. Lewis was, was an academic scholar and he talked about it a certain kind of way, but Brother Malcolm talked about it in a way that could reach out to people uh, who were not uh, basically people from the, uh, from the academic world. And, uh, and then um, Brother Malcolm also talked about another thing at that time that I had never heard before. And that was attacks on the mind, psychological warfare. I had never heard anything about that type of subject. And then I remembered as a child growing up in Tuskegee, Alabama, going to Tarzan movies Saturday after Saturday with my friends when we were young, between let's say six years old and 13 years old. And almost every Saturday we'd be watching Tarzan movies and, and cheering for Tarzan and Cheetah over the Africans. And we did not like the Africans. We thought they were ignorant because they did not speak. When they spoke with each other, they spoke in their own languages. So we were laughed at them because we thought they couldn't speak English. And um, it was so bad uh, uh, at that time that, that I can remember that you could call somebody a no good SOB or no good MF and they may fight you. But if you call them African or black 
That was a fight. That was a definite fight if you did that. So that was the type of thing that was done to our minds. And it's so it's critically important that people such as uh, 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 Carter G. Woodson and Lerone Bennett Jr. and Mary McLeod Bethune and Dr. C. Dolores Tucker understood this, the attacks on the mind and felt as though we had to do something about it. And uh, Brother Malcolm, uh, when we talk about Brother Marcus Garvey, people have, it's very important for people to remember that Brother Malcolm came from a family of Garveyites. His mother was the correspondent for the, for the Garvey movement out there in Michigan where they were living at that time. And his father had been, one of the reasons that his father had to leave Georgia was that he had become very, very uh, strongly attracted to the Garvey movement. And that was considered very, very uh, something down there that could get, literally get you killed. So he, he had to move his family from Georgia, uh, a brother Malcolm family. So he had, he had that background and that thing that, that thing that was there. And I think that, that that's very important to understand when you begin to realize you know, what he did to the years. I always say that uh, I like to think of Brother Malcolm uh, as a great human being, a great black man, mm -hmm. a great pan-Africanist mm -hmm. and a master teacher. Mm -hmm. And he was those four things. And to me, uh, one of one of the I, I, in each one of those instances, I learned from him. I was around him for the last fifteen months of his life uh, when he founded the OAAU Organization of African Unity, which was named after the Organization of African Unity and was deliberately named after the Organization of African Unity. And uh, I remember Brother Malcolm uh, was embarked on a campaign during that last year. Uh, his 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 commitment was that. The United States should be taken before the UN Commission on Human Rights for being either unable or unwilling to protect the lives and property of Black people. And so he, he, he would put together a campaign to make sure that that happened. And uh, at that time, the United States had not signed the UN Charter. And the reason they had not signed it was that if they signed the Charter, then an individual could take our case to the United Nations. Uh, and they did not want that. So since they did not sign it, and uh, Brother Malcolm had to try to get someone else to take our case. And of course, he was going for the African countries. Now we know at that time, this is the height of the so-called Cold War between the United States and Russia. Uh, the Russians or the Chinese, somebody like that would gladly have taken our case to the UN, but Brother Malcolm did not want that. He wanted African countries to do it. And that's why he did a lot of traveling in Africa during the last year of his life. And he spent much time meeting with African leaders, African students, African academics, and, and, and passing on his belief as to why Pan-Africanism was such, so important for all of us if we, were to, if we were to be able to promote and protect our interests in this world. And in May 1964, uh, while he was traveling in Africa, most people don't, are totally unaware that he had meetings of one and a half to three hours one and a half to three hours, not I see you at a reception, or we say hello, we talk maybe a couple minutes, then you move on. He had meetings of one and a half to three hours with the following African leaders, President Azikwe of Nigeria, President Nasser of Egypt, President Nkrumah of Ghana, President Kenyatta of Kenya, President Nyeri of Tanzania, President Toure of Guinea, and Prime Minister Oboto of, uh, of Uganda. He had meetings with them. And as a result of those meetings, they then invited him as a, to come to the, the 1964 meeting of the uh, Organization of African Unity that was held in Cairo as an observer, not as a participant, as an observer. And that was unheard of. It was the first, he was the first time that a person from this country had been invited for something like that. And then Brother Malcolm went there and put together an eight page document in which he explained how critical it was for the people of African descent, both on the continent and in North America, to get themselves together and work together, that our that that it, it was absolutely it was not something where you know if you do it fine if not it was something that if we were going to be in a position to promote and protect our interests in this world, it was absolutely necessary. Brother Bailey, put your sound back on.
Brother Bailey. Brother Bailey. He muted himself somehow. Yeah, Brother Bailey. Brother Bailey. Yeah, there you go. Uh, they then issued a resolution condemning discrimination in the United States. It was unheard of that they, they issued a resolution. He had resolved that, well, you know, uh, the, the African leaders did at the, at the OAU meeting in 1964. All of this because of what Brother Malcolm was doing. And this was just a part of it. I'm, I'm working on a book that's going to focus solely on what he was doing internationally. And it's going to include information that I think is going to be, have been bits and pieces in different books, but I'm putting it you know, in one, one spot, at least not all of it, of course, but I'm putting a, quite a bit of it in one spot so people can see what he was doing internationally. Because I don't think that you can really understand what Brother Malcolm was all about until you understand his, what he was doing internationally. And that's why I'm very glad uh, to be a part of this program today so that, that I can uh, uh, alert uh, fellow Pan-Africanists uh, that, that this was a critical part of Brother Malcolm's life. He considered that a critical part of his life. And that's why I say he was a, a great human being, a great black man, a great Pan-Africanist and a master teacher. Unmute yourself, Sangor. Yes, Brother Bailey. Well, uh, yeah. Before I go on, I want to ask you a couple of quick questions. And uh, before we get into some other dialogue, uh, you you work with Brother Malcolm. Uh, what what role did you play working directly with Brother Malcolm? Okay, I was the editor of the organization's newsletter, and uh, of course, it, it was at the very beginning. Back in those days, you had the old-fashioned a uh, mimeograph machine where you turned the handles to make copies. And uh, we ended up doing nine issues and we covered uh, at least of those nine issues, at least seven of them uh, have photographs of Brother Malcolm internationally, what he was doing internationally. I have copies of all nine of the issues that we did before he was assassinated and they will, the, the entire issues will be in the book, but we were covering what he was doing in Africa. And we ran pictures on the front pages of the newsletter of, of, of him with various African leaders and, and, and people. Right. Okay. That's that's very important because you know uh, there are a lot of books out on Malcolm and some good ones. In fact, this one right here that I asked you about earlier, "The Dead Are Arising." My tender love blessed me with this, uh, "The Life of Malcolm X" by Les Payne. Uh, Tamara Payne actually published it because uh, Les had left. But when I was talking to you about this book here, you mentioned that you had it and that you worked with. Les Payne, is that, is that so, sir? No, no I, didn't, I didn't work with Les. Les okay. and I were, were journalists in New York. Okay. We, were both, we were both members of the New York Association of Black Journalists. Gotcha. Was, for two years, I was president of that organization. Okay. And Les and I were, you know, we worked and we talked a lot and we had, we had you know, uh, we, uh, monthly uh, gatherings that we talked about journalists and the role of Black journalists, things they were doing. So I knew he interviewed me for about four hours when he was right. writing the book. And, uh, and, and I was given a copy of the book by one of Brother Malcolm's daughters. I haven't read it, and, but I did just check to see, and I noticed that he did not quote, he, he didn't quote me at all. He mentioned me twice, but he did not quote me at all. I was going to say, I, I thought he mentioned you, uh, but I, 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 I haven't finished the book, but I found it very interesting. And I just wanted to connect the dots because it's like very important because what we want people to understand is our ancestors are one. We need to study all of them, particularly Dr. Woodson. And we need to be really clear. <clears throat> a lot of people know of Dr. Woodson. My mother actually uh, went to Howard University as a student and served as a uh, intern secretary for three months with Dr. Woodson. Uh, so I got to talk to her and she got to let me know about how he was. And, you know, I think coming up in a couple of more years, I think they got a couple more years before they open up the house. But it is important for us to know that museum is going to be off the chain in terms of educating. But we can't wait for that to get the information, correct information to our youth about Dr. Woodson. And I don't see how you can study Dr. Woodson without, you know, studying uh, Marcus Garvey and studying uh, Malcolm X. 
So those we picked those three today because we feel those three are very important. There's a whole lot of other people that you need to study. You need to study Booker T. Washington. You need to study Nanny Ellen Burroughs. You need to study Mary Church Terrell. You need to study uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Yes, all, you need to study W.E.B. Du Bois. All of those giants who did work need to be studied and put into curriculums where people really find out what they were about. And that's, I want to say that, and I, and I want to come back to Brother Bailey, and I want to open it up to, to Baba Mosi so he can explore and take us even deeper. But it's so important for us to, 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 to understand the importance of knowing ourselves. And, you know, you know, Marcus Garvey always said that, you know, you got to know yourself. Well, well, if you don't know yourself, what else can you really know? <laughs> you got to know yourself. But to know yourself, you need to know your roots and culture. And Black History Month is not, I mean, no month, not just February, is enough time for us to find ourselves. In fact, we say all year long. And that's why the promotion that we put out is clear that we are utilizing Black History Month as an opportunity to educate brothers and sisters of the importance of studying our story all the time from our perspective. And that was Dr. Woodson's original intent. Sometimes we kind of just lump Woodson into, oh, well, he gave us Black History Month or he gave us Negro History Week, and then they don't even pick up a book, especially the miseducation of the Negro, because within the book, The Miseducation of the Negro, you will see the problem of the miseducation in the public school systems that still exist today. Now they got a pushback happening on books, certain books, now that people are reading their way up. We need to understand that, that, that the, the Yorugu's intent is never to really allow us to know who we are and educate ourselves, because if we do, we will rise up to our traditional greatness. So with that I'd said, like Brother to, ba Bailey, go I'd ahead, like, Brother. I'd like to say very quickly that my problem with Lish's book and is that he did not deal, deal enough with the, what Brother Malcolm was doing internationally. And, and, exactly. and most of the time when he interviewed me, that's what I focused on. But it's, it's interesting how most many of the books and things about Brother Malcolm, they, they don't want to deal with that. Yes. What he was doing internationally. Now, yeah. as for Dr. Woodson, it's, you know, you know, I've become a little bit harsh. I do not expect the public school system in the United States of America to teach our history. And I think that is going to be up to us and our institutions to teach our history. And it is if, if the fact that our children are almost totally unaware of Carter G. Woodson's book, The Miseducation of the Negro, I don't blame anybody else for that but us. I don't blame the white man. I don't blame nobody else. It is our responsibility to make sure that every black child in America is familiar with that book by the time he or she finishes high school. Mm -hmm. now, I'm sorry. I don't want to hear nothing about what they did, what oh, somebody else did, what they're going to do. Elder, don't be sorry. You sound our like, responsibility. Elder Bailey, you sound like Marcus Garvey. <laughs> don't, don't. Kid, if our kids are not aware of the mid education of the Negro and of those great books by Lerone Bennett Jr. and of other books, you know, Mary McCall, the things, some of the stuff that she did, that is our fault at this date in 2022, brother. I ain't hearing about what somebody else didn't do. I'm, I'm focused on what we didn't do. I hear you, sir. Like I said, you sounded like Garvey. But you know what, Brother Bailey? See, I know, but I want the listeners to really hear because I get to get to talk to you a lot and vibe with you a lot. But uh, you you mentioned Leroy Bennett. Tell us a little bit about your experience. Leroy Le 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I met Lerone. Uh, I was on the staff of Ebony Magazine from 1968 to 1976. And I had an opportunity to meet Lerone because I, I, had, I had joined uh, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And Lerone was always came to their meetings. And so I would meet him, you know, I would see, had a chance to talk to him at those meetings. And then of course, every, every now and then he would come to, to, to New York. To the, I work in, in Ebony's New York office. I didn't work in Chicago. I worked in a New York office. And every now and then he'd be in New York and he'd stop by. So I had a chance to, you know, to get to know him, you know, because he was one of my idols, you know, in terms of, of history, man. I mean, for me, that brother, he wrote an article called Why Black History is Important to You in a February 1982 issue of Mag Ebony Magazine. That should be required reading. Yes. Uh, Why yes, Black sir. History is Important to You. And it was in the February 1982 issue of Ebony Magazine by Lerone Bennett Jr. I okay. mean, 
It should be required reading, brother. Every right. black child in America should have to have read that article by the time they finish high school. You yes, know, sir. and if they and if they happen, it's our fault. Yes, sir. Teach. They teach. Now uh, I see that President General has his hand up. Uh, uh, Akili, you wanted to share something, PG? You got your hand up. Uh, yes, sir. I, I I do have my hand up, and yes, I did want to please, please, go share ahead. because I I want to uh, Peter Bailey. Uh, first of Bayagani to you, I, I met you when Charles R. James came to New York, not Charles R. James, Thomas W. Harvey, and the crew came to New York, I had the opportunity to meet you. So yeah. I, I, first greetings to you, but to, you. to stand on what you have said, and trying to make sure that we as UNIA ACLRC 2020, take the history lessons and make them a part of the teachings, because you're correct, it isn't the white man's fault that we don't know who the hell we are. It's ours because we have had great men and great women that have stood up and said, this is who we are. This is what we can do. Even under a system of capitalism and slavery, they stood up and they made it happen. So as we even talk about Carter G. Woodson and Negro History Week, let's, let's get it plain. He started with Negro History Day. Carter G. Woodson, as many of the historians, focused on our development and therefore our focus was on how we manage in America, but they laid the foundation for understanding our historical perspective as to who we are. You talk about Brother Malcolm in such a way that makes, makes me have chills. Because as I have read and studied him, I understood that. His death was not only timely, but unfortunate, but it was because he was moving in a way that the white man was scared of any black man moving. He was bringing Africans and American Negroes to the point that they understood that they were Africans in America, not Americans. That's the kind of consciousness that we have not promoted. See, so Negro History Month is technically Negro History Year. And it should be 365 days of teaching us who we are. I haven't mentioned Marcus Messiah Garvey for a reason. And so now I bring that up. The reason I hadn't mentioned him initially is because our conversation centers around the Honorable Malcolm X and his contribution, and also Carter G. Wilson and his contribution. So let's take it a step further. Marcus Messiah Garvey historically took us to a level that those men followed. Garvey was in between them and they followed. Garvey helped the Honorable Elijah Muhammad understand. Therefore, the teachings to the Honorable El Haj Malik El Shabazz, El, also known as Malcolm X, is ground worthy and conscious worthy in your experience and your life experience must be a part of the teachings for us to raise this race to the level of racial consciousness and to earth, therefore understand what a building a nation is going to be. Okay. So, I'm not trying to be connected to white America. I'm sorry, single. No, 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 that's you. fine. That's fine, sir, because we're going to go deep into uh, Freedom Friday. You and I and others going to go deep into the history and we're gonna continue this because it's critical. But I, I saw Tendai say something, and I want I want to if she can bring her camera up, Sister Tendai, because I saw you put something in the chat about uh, uh, Leroy and Bennett. Uh, Tendai, can you pull your camera up because we are? No, something's going on with it, and I didn't want to go out because I got to reset everything and put, do it apart. From remember when I was having that problems with my internet. Okay, okay. the reason I say that's because we on Facebook. But anyway, go ahead and make your comments still. No, I was just saying that when uh, Peter Bailey, uh, our, our, well, I'm an elder too now, so <laughs> <laughs> talked about Lerone Bennett, I just wanted to emphasize how important he was because I'm, I was in the Midwest, so I didn't have access to all of this stuff that you all did out here, but still I was utilized with the NAACP and the Urban League when I was a teenager to integrate the play, the, uh, the, the establishments downtown on their behalf. So I was doing all of that. So once I did, uh, when I moved to South Bend to take care of my father, he came to, uh, to Notre Dame University. 
And when I heard him on top of having been reading this stuff in Ebony, because that was the only thing I had access to was Ebony and Jet and all of that sort of thing. So um, when I did that, I went home, straight took the straightness out of my hair. I napped up my hair. I took off all of my European clothes and I re and I made dashiki dresses and made earrings to match them. And that was my introduction to my African identity. And I began to study and I went forth from there. Well, all right. All right. <laughs> and so I, I, and I like to say to him that, that, that that's a beautiful statement that 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 a lot of times those of us in, in our end of the movement, we sometimes we be very critical of John H. Johnston in the Ebony magazine. But Leron Bennett Jr was a product, not a product, but J John H. Johnson made Lerone Bennett Jr. possible. He published all of his books. He, could, he read all of his articles. He was the one who made Lerone, made Lerone available to us in Ebony Magazine. And my position is whatever some of the things he did that we find you know, wrong or misguided, that doing that alone kind of outweighs some of those other things there. The fact yeah. that he was the one who introduced us to Lerone, man. Because Lerone, to me, was a person who could write history in a way that even a high school, it was, it, was, it, was, it was scholarly and academic and all of that, but it was written in such a way that a high school student could also read it and understand it. Wow. Because I used to give it to students, well, not high school students, but I used to teach a, a journalism uh, courses on the black press to students that I've taught that at three different universities, I've taught courses on the black press. And of course, I always, you know, they, they got to know their own, you know, in that class, man, I, I, I talk about him all the time. But, but I, and I say to them that, 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 that this man, if you get anything, you see anything he wrote, you better grab it and read it. Because you will learn something. You are going to learn something. The brother was teaching us up until the date, to the, you know, the end of his life. Right. And uh, and we owe that whatever else is probably we have with him. We owe that to John H. Johnson and the Ebony Magazine. Okay, so what I want to do right here is go turn it back, give it back, give the uh, the mantle back to Baba Mosi, and we're gonna continue to reason. But I want I, I, I'm sure Baba Mosi has some things he wants to share as well as uh, maybe some uh, uh, to take us a little deeper into the conversation. Uh, so Baba Mosi, I'm, I'm I'm turning it back over to you, Brother Bailey. Stay put. Uh, and thank you, Brother Bailey. You know, if those that are listening out there, Facebook, and those that are here on the Zoom, we're getting a history lesson tonight. And we talk about our story, her story, our story, history, from our perspective. Baba Mosi. Yeah, well, thank you, Baba. You know, uh, you know, A. <laughs> Peter Bailey, um, you know, has, has said very little about himself. I mean, and there's a lot about him that a lot of people out there don't know. He's worked with a lot of great people, and uh, you know some some of those. Uh, uh, one of those people is John Henry Clark, and uh, and uh, you know I'd like to ask you, my brother, um, tell us what working with John Henry Clark was 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 like because uh, you know I, I've heard story he was not one of the easiest people. So let me hear that. If <laughs> he, he was not, he was not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I lived in Harlem about three blocks from Dr. Clark's home. I met Dr. Clark uh, when we were forming the OAAU, the Organization of African American with Brother Malcolm. When mm -hmm. I went to that very first meeting uh, to set it up, one of the people who was there was Dr. Clark. Now I had heard about him kind of, but I had never met him. And that's when I met him for the first time. And, and I got to know him. And so I would go over to his house on, on 138th Street in Harlem. And man, his whole, he had a brownstone in Harlem, man. And the whole basement level, every inch of that basement level was covered with books, man. I used to go down there, I could not believe when I went down there and, and went through it and just looked at all those black books and books on black history and all that kind of stuff and papers. And, 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 and Dr. Clark was very, very, uh, because I, I was, a, you know, I learned very early to be a listener. You know, you, I tell people you got to be a sister, you can be a great speaker, but you also have to be a great listener. You know, that's very important. And so I would just listen to Dr. Clark as he was talking and telling me things. And and uh, and and he was the one of the ones, you know, who who uh, I remember I wrote an article <laughs> and sent it to his publication, Freedom Waves, mm -hmm. uh, about about uh, 
uh, and I was criti I was I was criticizing. It was something black folks did, some something they did and said, and and I in the article I just kind of made I wrote an article making fun of them for 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 for, for doing this kind of thing, you know. And uh, Doctor, I sent it to Freedom Ways, un, you know, un un un, un, un uh, asked for. I just said it, you know, like as uh, I was still very young in in the in the in, as a journalist at that time. And so Dr. Cox sent it back to me and, and said that he could not use it. So I, when I met him late, I said, Dr. Cox, why do you, he said, you know why? He said, because you, you, you rightfully scolded those people and ridiculed them uh, for what, you know, for what, what they had done and what they were believing. He said, but you didn't tell them why they believed that. Hmm. And I never forgot that. <laughs> he said, you should have explained to them why, what this country and the white supremacist society had done that 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 come you know that kind of led them to believe this kind of thing. He says so. You ridiculed them without providing some kind of uh, you know response, and 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 I, I never forgot that you know. And from then on, in all my writings, man, I made sure that I that I didn't just attack. That I also offered you know ways, you know things you could do, things places you could go books you could read, programs you could watch, people who you could go hear lecture, you know, and, and, uh, and I got that because of Dr. Clark. Uh, I, I thought I had written a fabulous article, man. I, <laughs> but he said it was, it really was, but you didn't, you, you just ridiculed the people you did not, you know, tell them or give them some direction as to what they could do to change things. Yes, uh, that, and that sounds like uh, some of the things we still need to do when, when, when you know, uh, a lot of us get up there and 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 criticize uh, about mm -hmm. some of the things, especially when you criticize what what some of our people are doing in 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 Congress and 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 elsewhere uh, when they're so powerless. Uh, but you know, um, what do you think are some of the things we could be doing now uh, to to like to educate the public or 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 raise our consciousness as black people? As towards where we need to go, I I think that 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 we could pull together. I think we could we could across the country, different in different major urban centers around the country, we could pull together a conference, and I call it a conference, a a a, a positive. You know, every time a black organization is just about get together, we get there and spend maybe two days. We moaning and groaning and cussing and everything about what the white folks have done. We never talk about what we're gonna do about it. What solutions oriented things. We never talk about solutions. All we do is describe horror, tell horror stories, describe things. So I would like to see across this country, uh, maybe in maybe a dozen or 20 major urban centers around this country that black people hold what I call a strengths conference. And at that conference, we would get together and we would have people talk about our economic strengths, our health strengths, our educational strengths, our uh, technology strengths, our uh, legal strengths, our, uh, uh, oh, then I'm missing a couple. But, but you know, in each, about seven different arenas, we would get together and talk about our strengths our political strengths, instead of sitting there saying, oh, they did this and they did that and they did this and, they did that, and then going home. We need to have solutions oriented gatherings where we talk about, we talk about what we have going for us and then how we can make that more effective and positive. I really think we should start doing that. So and uh, and uh, I, I would love to see uh, at least maybe at least 20 urban centers around the country. I live in DC. Uh, we have what I have a, a strengths conference. Instead of always depicting ourselves as, oh, woe is us, Lord, you poor, Negroes, you know, that kind of stuff. We, we're some strong people. We just don't acknowledge and recognize our strengths because we spend so much time thinking that the best way to attract government money, uh, to attract uh, uh, financial support from some big white endowments is to, is to make us sound like we just about one step from the you know from the you know from the grave and and that that way they will give us money well i don't i don't believe that mm -hmm. i think that 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 we should focus on 
And you know, that does not mean that you ignore certain things, but you you say so and so and so. Now here's what we can do about that. So they did so and so and so and so and so. Now here's what we could what political, political the political commission. What do you think we can do about that? The health commission, what do you think we should do about that? The economics division, what do you think we should do about that? The 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 technology division, what do you think we should do about that? The education committee, what can we do about that? All these different arenas, we should have people who are specialists and knowledgeable in these areas. And when something pop up in these arenas, instead of trying to deal with all of them in one big scoop, we say, okay, this is a, a, a voting rights thing. Okay, political committee, come up with some concrete things we can do to deal with this situation. So Baba Mosa, before you, before you go on, I, I, Brother Bailey, that's a great answer. I, I really appreciate you sharing that. I wanna share something because you know I don't need to do a whole lot of this, you know, presentation because I haven't done one yet. But I want to share this because what Bailey, brother Bailey, just said, Dr. Woodson said, for a decade, Woodson taught in public schools of Washington D.C. I don't know how many people knew he actually taught in public schools. He also served as the dean at Howard University and West Virginia Institute before retiring from teaching and administration. Now here's the great work that Brother Bailey was just talking about. Woodson spent the bulk of his career building the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, which he established in 1915, founded on the idea that people of African descent had to correct the historical record and demonstrate their role in history to take their proper place in the world. And so he established at that time the Journal of Negro, the, the Journal of, of, of the Negro, now the Journal of African American History. And in 1926, Woodson initiated the Negro History Week. Now I say that because what Brother Bailey just said, this is 2022. Yes. It's extremely similar to what Woodson was trying to get us to do then. So Brother, I read a I read a recent, I wrote a column recently in which I read a paper a black newspaper called the People's Pilot in Richmond, Virginia in 1919 mm -hmm. said that black institutions should set aside one hour each day. Mm -hmm. where they call their people together and they talk about relative, you know, black uh, situations. Right. And that these, that these institutions should then work together to, you know, to deal with whatever the problem is. This brother wrote this back in 1919 in a paper called the, the People's Pilot in Richmond, Virginia. Then I then I included a 19 uh, article by Martin Luther King in his book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos Our Community, in which he advocated the same thing that our organization should join together and focus on dealing with specific issues that and have they have expertise in, and that this would would, would help us out. Uh, advance and promote our, and protect our interests in the society better. See, I, I'm talking about, so this is nothing new. Right. We, Garvey, Marcus Garvey did this. Right. And I will always believe that if, 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 if the United States government had not been able to, to, uh, to you know, to, uh, what do you call it, uh, send him away? Mm -hmm. What do you call it when you send somebody, put them out of the country? Uh, they they, they uh, deported him. Yeah, if they're not able to force, deport him, force, they would force eventually, deportation. They would have, they would eventually had him assassinated. Right. But because but, they could deport him, they didn't have to do that. Right. You know, so they, they, so they, they used the deportation to get rid of him. Right. And, and, they, uh, and they made that attempt. They made that assassination attempt too. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, no, I'm not saying they didn't try, but I'm saying that 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 they would have made been, they would go going after him. No, you're right, it, sir. Malcolm, the way right. they did Brother Malcolm and Dr. King, so, back every those folks, but be, be, because if he had not been able, if they had not been able to deport him, so one of I, us, and, I, and I always think, I always tell people that you cannot really talk about this kind of stuff without talking about Brother Marcus Garvey. Right. In in fact, that first statement that you read, right, the first thing you read, I want to get that because I want to put that into the book. I'm oh, sure, on, sure, sure, Brother uh, Bailey. Brother Malcolm's international agenda. So I'll make sure you get all of that. But uh, okay. also, also was mentioned in our chat. Uh, Tendai mentioned somebody very important who I studied. That's David Walker's appeal. Yes. Uh, it's so much. Yeah. See, see, what today was about was to get us to understand the importance of knowing self. Like you say, yeah. if we if we just talk about the problem and don't deal with the solutions, then we we miss the boat. Because you talk about you you, you talk about uh, 
the problems and you always be in the problem. But if you talk about you that, I bet you that that ninety percent of black people in the United States of America don't have the slightest idea as to what David Walker's appeal is. That's mm -hmm. that's a very important point. And, and you know, and you know who I blame for that? Us. I don't mm -hmm. blame nobody but us. Right. And 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 and, and, and you know, it's so many that we could name, but I appreciate uh, sister naming that. But uh, also another sister uh, mentioned the, the, the question that, that the Baba Mosi asked you was excellent. And it also uh, is up to the UNIA. And, I, and I, I won't get into it now, Brother Bailey, but I'll talk to you later about it. But the UNIA is working on establishing memorandums of understanding with different groups and to sit down at the table around specific issues, like you said, to deal with solutions to those those issues and that's I put some things in the chat I'm not asking you to go check it out and uh, I put some websites in the chat and I also put them on Facebook uh, and I would love our listeners to check those out and there's many others I I want Baba Mosi to to, to 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 take it back over and also mention how people can join the UNIA because you know we're interested in people who first of all all black people are members but we're interested in people that pay their dues that are interested in helping us do the work and building the upkeep. And earlier you heard the president general and him and I will be on on the next Freedom Friday talking about some specifics of some of the work going on. But without any further ado, back to you, Baba Mosi. And I know you might want to open it up. I know you might have some more questions, but you might want to open it up. So I will reserve my presentation to dis discussion. Okay, well, you know, we, you, you're going to have a, about 60 minutes after we, we are done to, to uh, formulate whatever you have to do right? no. so, uh, <laughs> we got it. but at we... this point at this point uh, at this point let me let me get back to to ap the bill and, and ask him a, a, another question dealing with with the kind of work he was doing and uh you know uh, you uh a, a great journalist as you are uh you 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 did a lot of work with malcolm and you i don't know if you specifically dealt with international stuff with malcolm but uh, a lot of things that Malcolm dealt with was definitely uh, a, a national. And when I say national, I mean the US uh, and, and Africans in the United States and, and the kind of confrontations they've had with, uh, with, with the, the, the governmental agencies. Um, uh, what do you think is, is the situation now? With, 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 we're still in, that we're still in. Uh, what do you think Malcolm would be saying now concerning that, that that situation we've got now would would he would he still be happy or <laughs> i think he'd be basically saying the same thing he was saying then that we need brother malcolm believed in unity most people are totally unaware that in 1963 when he was still in the nation of islam brother malcolm sent a letter a letter to seven top civil rights leaders Martin Luther King, Roy Wilkins, Whitney Young, James Farmer. Uh, 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 I don't know, but, but it was seven of them. He sent them a letter. And, he, and in this letter, he said to them, if communistic Khrushchev and capitalistic Kennedy can sit down together and discuss things, problems that they have with each other, why can't we do this? He say, and to, so to begin such a thing, I'm inviting you to come to uh, a, a Nation of Islam rally that we're having uh, on 116th Street in Harlem and, and invite you to come and speak and present your positions, your organization's position to the, to the crowd. And he said, and I guarantee you that you will be treated with respect. In other words, he was saying, there ain't gonna be nobody out there, you know, causing trouble and messing with y'all. And, and he sent it up and, and do you know, not one of them responded, not one of them responded. So he was making this type, he knew, he understood even early that it was, that this type of, of, of unity was needed for us and we're gonna ever effectively confront white supremacy in this society. That this, this organization over here and this organization over here and this one over here is just not gonna do it. It's going to require some sense of unity. And he, he, he did that, like I said, in 1963, when he was still in the Nation of Islam. He was making that type of, 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 of appeal to the, to, the, to the major civil rights leaders. 
So uh, Brother Malcolm clearly understood. Uh, and he, and of course he kept that up when he, when he went then uh, to the Afri Organization of African Unity and made the same kind of approach when he gave them an eight page document. And he outlined in detail as to how you will never be completely independent without us. And we will never be completely independent without you. Not maybe, it just absolutely, it will not happen. And Brother Malcolm understood that. And that's why he, and he, he was not some kind of romantic, some people like, they, they talk about unity in some kind of almost romanticized way. He, didn't, he knew that it was gonna be difficult and hard and, and, and called, you know, but it was absolutely necessary if we're ever going to be in a position to promote and, and protect the, the interests of people of African descent in this world that we live in. Right now, brother, and I, and I read a, a 2009 a supplement that was in the Washington Post newspaper. And you know, the Washington Post is one of the three most powerful newspapers in America. They did an eight page supplement on Africa. You know, you know what the, the headline of that supplement was? Africa on the agenda, not Africa's agenda. Africa, that was the headline of the supplement. You know what the subhead said? Africa, the key to global economic growth. Now, how can you be the key to global economic growth and be on somebody else's agenda? You should be setting the agenda. And we're not able to do that because we are not unified. And, and, and until, we, until we understand that, we're gonna, we, we're gonna be constantly uh, exploited by Asia, Europe, and North America. That's true. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, I, I, I think um, yeah, th that's understood uh, to a, a great deal because even Kwame Nkrumah uh, um, in, in his appeal to Africans have, have uh, said stuff like that, Africa must unite. Uh, going in the same direction. Uh, today, we, 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 we wonder, uh, and, and, and I'm going from your international experience, uh, we wonder what is going on in Africa when, when we're hearing of, of uh, the, the Europeans' interventions and, uh, and Africans' uh, coups, and, and it seems like there's total confusion. Um, you know, what's, what's, what's your take on, on what's you know what going I, on there? You know what I think the colonials the colonials decided, they said, here's what we're gonna do. We're not gonna fight independence. If you get 10 Africans, they're on one acre of land and they call themselves the Republic of whatever, we're gonna have, they're gonna have ambassadors from Washington, Peking, Moscow, Paris and London the next day. Right now there are 56 countries, quote unquote, in Africa, and every and 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 this is the, exactly what the other three continents want. If Africa is the key to global economic growth, the economic the other three continents know that the best way to exploit this is for the African people to be constantly disunited. And brother, as I said on other things, I am now blaming that on us. I ain't blaming it on nobody else. They made that position very clear. It's up to us to understand the importance of why we should become more united and work together to, 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 to protect and promote our interests both in North America and on the continent. And if we don't do that in 2022, brother, as far as I'm concerned, that's our fault. I hear you, sir. Uh, see, that I, I, I hear you, brother Bailey, and I, I understand clearly, I, I, I tried to, you know, when in introducing you, I was letting people know your Pan-African connection because a lot of people need to understand Elder Bailey is still very active and, and not only uh, active in the sense of writing on Malcolm, but uh, anytime we can, we can get you on, sir, you know, this is why Baba Mosi and, I, and, and, and you go head on. Brother Bailey, you being on with us is, is very, very uh, important because uh, you know many of us are up in age, but you you are our elder, and not only that, you you don't take no stuff. I mean, you you, you, you know the work on February, you did on February twenty four. Yes, sir. I will be I will be eighty four. Yes, sir. And uh, you know you work you did some work with Brother Sam, and I, I have to mention him because Sam is young youngin, 
and he would be yeah. here with us tonight if he didn't have something to do. But yeah. you have taken not only Sam, but a whole lot of young brothers and sisters under your wing. And I know that because I, I'm one of them. And, 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 and I want you to talk a little bit about the importance of what young brothers and sisters in the, in the field of journalism, in the field of history, in the field of this. And, and, and I know the answer, but I want everybody to hear it because I hear it all the time from you. All of us ain't gonna make it. And you don't spend a lot of time on folks that is naysaying or attacking. You, you're concerned about those people who wanna know. So speak to yeah. us a little bit about I, that. I, I, I figured that at the age of 84, Anybody who requires hours and hours of, of uh, explaining, I really don't have, you know, a begging, I guess you would call it. I don't have time for it. I want those young brothers and sisters who are serious Pan-Africanists. And what they want to know is what are some of the ad advice, suggestions I have that might enable them to advance this cause of Pan-Africanism. And, 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 and so that's who I talk to now. Those who, and, and uh, people say, oh, you're ignoring people. No, I'm not. We'll, we'll go after them later. <laughs> but if everybody who has ever organized anything, you first organize the true believers. We try to organize the quote unquote masses. You got to organize the true believers. I don't care where they are. The true believer is a carpenter, a bus driver, a, a, a PhD, a, a, a medical doctor or whatever. If they truly believed in Pan-Africanism and the absolute importance of Pan-Africanism, then that's who we want to pull them together and, and, and get them together and dealing with each other. And then once we get the, the true believers organized, then you can come up with programs designed to reach out you know, and try to pull other people in. But we, we go the other way. We try to get everybody in on the beginning and it's not, it don't happen like that. No movement ever in history has ever been, been moved like that. You always have the, the, the true believers get together, they organize, they then reach out. And if they get two people here, three new people here, five new people here, maybe 20 people here, and you build the movement. And you also got to understand, brother, get out of this idea that you're going to do something today and see some major result two weeks from now. Ain't happening. You know, Carol Cruz, Carol Cruz was the one who told me that. Carol Cruz said, you know, you better understand that, that you, you, what you're doing today uh, you may, they may not see the results of the 25 years from now. And you may not be around, but it's still important that you do it. Sure. Yes. Well, thank you for that. You know, before, uh, you know, if I, you know, I, I, I'm going to stop asking questions now and try to see there's a, there are a bunch of people on, uh, who are participating here. And I, let me see if there, there anybody has any questions for you. Uh, does anybody have any questions for? Uh, Not particularly a question, but I do have my hand raised. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't see that. It's a gold <laughs> hand. Then maybe that's okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay, my brother. Okay, uh, uh, my brother Peter Bailey, you are so articulate and on target as to the role and what we have to do, because organizing doesn't start with the many; it starts with the few. As the honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. And the men and women that followed him showed us, and those men and women whose siblings followed the Honorable El Haj Malik El Shabazz, otherwise known as Malcolm X. My point that I want to bring up is that what we talk about one Africa, we have to talk about one consciousness. Because if we talk about one consciousness, then those who believe in one Africa fall into that consciousness. And as you put forth historical data that people have to gravi should gravitate to, our role as RC 2020 is to say this is what we as an entity has to do in order to create the government for African people worldwide. It, it is not a continental struggle. The, the comments you've made about El Haz Malik El Sabaz, which I have known is that he wasn't about just settling things in America. When he reached out to the civil rights leaders and said after the bombing of the church, he said, we here to protect you. They didn't understand. One of the things that one of the many things that are important is to make sure that we tell truth and let truth be power. Because the legacy that Honorable 
El Haas Malik Al Shabazz, as also known as Malcolm X, follows the legacy of the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. And in between the two would be the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and other civil rights leaders, because Martin Luther King, too, was beginning to understand race was relevant and therefore to change the, the flavor of America, which is why he was assassinated, because he became a race man in America. Most Negroes are race Negroes in America. What we have to do is, as you have said tonight, is to build the consciousness for race Black people, race Africans, universal. Whenever we hear the term universal, any conscious African relates to the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey as a part of and the initiator of that thrust. However, he was not the only one. It was just that what he did became the broader voice because there was voices before him that inspired him to move forward as you are a voice to us to inspire us to move forward as we hopefully will be voices to inspire those who are younger than us to move forward. We yes, have to, and I'm going to stop, we have to understand a, who we are. B, what's the mission? C, what's the duties? And if we get to duties, we are all right. Sante, Sana, uh, Baba Mosey. Uh, one, uh, one of the other things that Brother Malcolm taught us was that he said that everywhere I speak, I know there are people in the audience whose sole reason for being there is to catch me factually wrong. Yes, that's what, so my, that's what Garvey said. So they can go after me on the facts. He said, so here's what you do, what you must do when you're speaking. You must make sure that you got your facts. And they may disagree with your interpretation of the facts or your opinion about the facts, but never let them catch you with your facts wrong. And that's what he always taught us. And he, he, also says, taught, us, he taught us to be careful with words in the very first issue of the newsletter that I wrote. I, after that killing of that boy in Harlem in 1964, oh, yeah. Jeez, I wrote an article about that in the first issue of the OAAU newsletter. And, and Brother Malcolm was in Africa at the time. So he would call back to the office and we would, you know, the people who had different jobs to do would speak to him on the phone. So when it was my turn to speak with him, I read him the, the article that I'd written about the killing of that young boy. And, and I said, eyewitnesses to the murder. And Brother Malcolm stopped me. He said, no, Brother Peter. Don't call it a, it a murder, because murder and murderer are legal terms that you can only use once the person has been convicted. And, if, and he said, call it a killing, because it's a killing no matter what the circumstance. He said, if you call that cop a murder and he's acquitted, and we know he's going to be acquitted, he can then sue for libel. And he later sued both SCLC and, and a core for calling him a murderer. And so what we had already run off about 500 copies of that first page with that old fashioned machine. So this brother who worked with me as a production manager, we sat down and scratched out the word <laughs> murder and wrote killing in there. And we, we distributed it just like that. We just scratched out the word murder, you know, with, covered with ink and wrote killing at the top, printed killing at the top of it, and then distributed the newsletter like that. But that's the kind of thing. And I try to tell the young people, you know, don't get, don't get yourself in trouble because of something you said. Because and 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 it's and it's factually wrong. You something somebody can you say something, then somebody can take you to court and keep. And though it may be very weak, it can keep you tied up in the courts for two or three years. Right. Absolutely. You know, you know so as you an know, editor, you got to know words, man. You got to be knowledgeable. Yes, sir. As, as an editor words. of what we call the black newspaper, here started in Philadelphia and went about the world. You are hundred percent correct because language and is, is extremely important because you don't want to set yourself up. Because see, the all, white man is always working against you. You can't set yourself up. But my brother, it's a, it is truly an honor just just to have this interaction with you. Thank you, Bob Mosey and Brother Stingor and Brother Pila really for making it happen. Thank you, brother. Okay, uh, let me see if there's a, anyone else would like to uh, posit a question to you, Brother Peter Bailey. Uh, if not, um, I, I will just ask you this, this last thing because 
you mentioned that you had written an article about uh, the shooting of a young man in Harlem. And in 1964. You, 1964? Yes. And I would, since then. Yeah, uh, just before the riots in Philadelphia. Just uh -huh. so you know. Okay. Since then, we've had shootings over and over and over and over. We're still complaining. Um, uh, what what do you think is happening? Uh, and and uh, how, how would you go about dealing because with this? We're doing, because we're doing the same things we were doing 50 years ago. Yes. Everybody want to get out in the streets and start chanting no justice, no peace, and Black Lives Matter and all that kind of stuff. So it, instead of doing something that is, if, let's say when they when they shot that young boy in the young man in Fayette, in, I think it was in Ferguson or somewhere, a place called Ferguson. Yeah. This and, is a place and, where Black people were 65% of the population. Mm -hmm. The other 35 were, were Caucasian. And instead of being out there in the streets waving signs, all you had to do was go to those boys who, who, who own those stores and everything in the town and say, listen, we ain't buying nothing from y'all till y'all take care of that situation. We have to drive 15 miles out of the way to purchase. We ain't buying nothing. And they would have dealt with that situation. We do not, you, you, you rarely hear us talk about economics. All we talk about is electoral politics and civil rights. We never talk about how you can more effectively use our collective economics. We spend $1.3 trillion in this country, and I'll bet you a trillion of that we give to other, or other people, other religious people, or other ethnic groups, you know, and, uh, or other, race, or other racial groups. You know, Ashe. so that's we, don't have, we, have, we have absolutely, we do practically nothing in the arena Ashe. of economics. And, and as a group of people, as, as, as Kelly Miller, who was professor at Harvard University years ago, I think it was back in the 1950s, he said, unfortunately, we as a people have a tendency, we pay for what we want and beg for what we need. I say, I say. We need, to, we need to stop that, man, and start, using our, and start using, you don't have to get in the streets and wave signs and demonstrate. You, you, when something happens, if you probably 40% of somebody's profits, you go to them and say, you do something about that situation or we ain't buying from you. I so, say. So knowing, knowing Brother Bailey was going to be on with us, I put two, I put, I put quite a few links, not only in the chat, but also on Facebook. And two of them are very important. I put Us Lifting Us in there, their website, and I put Appeals website. Both of those groups specialize in solving most of our economic issues. So for those who are listening and those on Facebook, check them out, please. Because what Brother Bailey just said is, no matter how politically conscious you get, if you got no economic power, you got no political power. Simple as that. You so will never, you will never have political power without economic power. Right. You may have a limited degree of political influence, but you will never have political power without economic power. And if you have economic power, you automatically have political power. Oh, that's very important. What you just said is super important. And that's that's one of the missions of I say. Garveyism and the UNIA is very clear. Everybody talks about the 6 million people that we had. We want to look at the 6 million people we're going to have. I want to right. say that again. Not looking at the 6 million that we had, but working on the 6 million that should be here with us right now working and, and and we're working on it but at any rate baba mosi yes sir uh, i i want to thank you a peter bailey thank you again and uh for being here with us this evening uh that that was a wonderful conversation and you know with with uh, freedom friday we, we 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 have a conversation we we don't have you know we don't talk about debates and and and, and debunks we talk about conversation and we talk about information and we talk about unity like you did. And so we are very happy that you were here, you were here with us. And, and uh, you know, if we may have some other questions, but, uh, you know, uh, Baba Singh Gore wanted to have something to say further. No, no so, well, 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 Baba Mosi, it's, it's not about me, he or she, it's about we collectivity. And Brother Elder Bailey is one of my teachers. And all throughout, I've been sharing, but I will say this to everybody heed the call y'all i've been checking out what people are putting in facebook let's just don't talk if you're serious come on walk with us because we're serious we're, we're tired of talking 
like Brother Bailey said, we don't be demonstrating. We're putting our energy into practical action. And Woodson Banneker, Jackson Bay Division 330 of the UNIACL is looking for members in Banneker City. Also, Harambe Division 369 is looking for members anywhere in the United States. We're in Sierra Leone. I heard today a, a lot a lot of talk on WOL about people expatriating. I put a link in there for you to check out how you can expatriate, uh, uh, be, become, how you can repatriate as an expatriate in an organized fashion. One of the problems we have is everybody think they can travel to Africa and go as a tourist. Listen, you can invest and expatriate to Africa without even getting on an airplane. Look at some of the links that were put in there. This, this February 2022, I want everybody to heed the call of what we heard from our elder brother Bailey. But no, it's deeper than talk. We are trying to get you focused on studying your correct history, heritage, and culture so you know yourself. We ain't got time to mess around and debate, as Baba Mosi say. We ain't got time for that. Y'all do that somewhere else. If you come in our house, roll your sleeves up. We're going to be working. And this Black History Month is not just about the month. We are laying down the facts that Dr. Woodson's original intent wanted us to study our story all the time. I want to thank uh, all of the well, can, I, can, I say, can I say something real quick? Of course. That I, that I forgot to say. That's OK, uh, Brother Bailey. Especially on the question of Pan-Africanism, which I think is, I, I like Brother Malcolm, believe that that was our salvation. That was our only salvation as a, for people of African descent, it was a strong Pan-Africanism. And, and, and I wanna to say to our brothers and sisters, you cannot be very effective in this arena if you are a if Muslim Pan-Africanist, a <laughs> Christian Pan-Africanist. Teach, brother, teach. A Norwegian, a, Norwe a, a, Nor a Nigerian Pan-Africanist, a Tanzanian Pan-Africanist a Ghanaian Pan-Africanist, an Ethiopian pan, uh, a pan an Ethiopian pan you must be, if we're to, if we're to do what, what Brother Marcus Garvey, Brother Malcolm X, Brother Conway and Kuma and those other great Pan-Africanists, uh, 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 Martin Delaney, what, what they were trying to get us to understand is that you must be a Pan-Africanist Muslim, a Pan-Africanist Christian, a Pan-Africanist Nigerian, a Pan-Africanist Ghanaian, a Pan-Africanist Tanzanian, and a Pan-Africanist Ethiopian. Pan-Africa must become the first identity. Yes, Shake, I was, hey, Baba, thank you, Baba. You, 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 you went right where I was getting ready to go because Shake out the D out and broke it down to us. And people that don't understand Pan-African federalism, you need to get with brother Sam or get with me and we will break it up for you. It's real. Like what, 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 what Brother Bailey just laid out is, you cannot be a micro Pan-Africanist. Pan you have to be a holistic Pan-Africanist, meaning you gotta be a Pan-Africanist first, and that's then you, everything else after that. That after is very that. important because that's the unifying factor right there. See, and, that's, and, and by the way, that's the way Asia, Europe, and North America sees us. And that's exactly what Sheikh Atta Diop wrote in his books. He made it clear to us, you have to have an African-centered consciousness. And Baba Akili, you're absolutely correct. There ain't gonna be no unity calling for unity. They gotta be unity for you unifying in yourself and wanting to unify with your brother and sister. And that's got to be your consciousness. I so what we need to understand brothers and sisters is, we have everything we need. We just are not utilizing it. What did, Kelly, Miller, what did Kelly Miller say? We pay for what we want and beg for what we need. Yes. And if I may, and, and I, I want to try to fall in line because I raised my hand. So I'm saying no, to Baba Mosi. No, no, no. no, 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 it's on me. It's on me. Baba Mosi turned it over to me. He gave me okay. all the rest so, of the time. So Go ahead, PG. Where, whereas I don't disagree with the tool because the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey gave us the tool. He didn't call it Pan-Africanism. He didn't even call it Garveyism. We do. But in, when we understand the Honorable Elhaz Malik El-Shabazz, we link the title of Pan-Africanism to him. 
But the actual teachings was understanding who you are and recognizing where your unity needs to be and recognizing where your oppressor is. I didn't sell anybody on a slave ship or on a place in Virginia, which is where that historical slavery gets its 1619 date. So as we began to teach our people and challenge our people and give them facts, we also have to give them the energy that Brother Peter Belly gave tonight of the accomplishments, Nkrumah's accomplishments, Kenyatta's accomplishments, so Bukwe's accomplishments, to show that African people around the world can accomplish, to show that when when, when SCLC faced the bombing of the church, El Haz Malik El Sabah stood up and said, I got your back. And that's what we have to do, which meant that he put aside as he asked the others to do religious differentiations. We as a people have been so politically, culturally tainted that our blackness has to become our shield. Our consciousness has to be based on our African origin, not our conditions. If we are to change our situation as we have these conversations, we have to put them on high. We have Sister Tendaya on this line tonight, which brings to us the spiritual connections from on high. Let us never think that the conversation without the spiritual connection is on high. Because as we move forward, we have to change the minds of over 35 million people. And if we only start with America, if we only start here, the whole continent of Africa is caught up in the same type of oppression because they also don't believe that they are equal to because they have also got caught up in a European system and the European dynamics. So my brother Peter Belly is saying to us, this is what I hear. If you are about Pan-Africanism, if you are about Garveyism, we got a challenge not just what happens on the states, but what happens on the continent. Right. So, so PG, uh, yes. I, 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 I don't please don't go leave leave that point. I ain't I just, leaving. I just want I just want to wrap up for everybody. <laughs> I want everybody to understand. I, 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 the uh, uh, let me say, uh, there's a question in the chat that uh, that is uh, posited to Peter Bailey, and that has to do with uh, with 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 land, and I and I am assuming that you know uh, land uh, uh, heritage. Uh, left by ancestors uh, that are being stolen, and uh, what 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 is your take on that? You know, we 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 having issues with uh, you know with farmland, uh, homestead land, uh, lots of land that is disappearing out of the hands of African people in the United States. Well, that to, again, <laughs> our people, when our people made the great migration from from uh, the south to the north in the, in the uh, early 1920s. Unfortunately, many of us left behind the land that we had and, and did not pay the taxes. And so the state took it over and then the state sold it to white folks. That's how we, we lost a whole lot of land that way. I know my grandfather, unfortunately, my grandfather did not, did not migrate, but he had the, he had, my grandmother rather had the, when, when, when she died, uh, the, the, the house and the home and the land that we had in Tuskegee, Alabama, my grandmother put it under air rights. And that meant that nobody in my father's generation, my father, his 11 brothers and sisters and first cousins and all of those, none of them could sell one inch of that land without everybody agreeing. And that, and that has now come down to my generation and we have the same thing. Nobody in our family can sell one inch of that land without everybody agreeing. So that land is still in our family. Unfortunately, a lot of black folks did not do this and we lost millions. And brother, when I say this, I'm talking about 
10, 15 million acres of land uh, as a result of the migration north. And, 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 uh, and, and, and of course, we've tried to get some of it back, but we still uh, uh, have, are not making that a, a part of our agenda. That's again, like other things when I talk about, you know, that would be a, if we would, one of our, that would be a part of our economic agenda. You know, as to how we can more effectively take care of the land that we own in, you know, in this in this country, yeah. and uh, so, so uh, that that is extremely important. Land ownership is very important. Our ancestors in in, in the early 1900s, man, they owned a whole lot of land down south, but when they migrated north and just left it there, uh, the states took it over, and then they either gave it or sold the land to white folks, and it, and those that didn't do that. If you didn't pay your taxes, my grandmother was smart enough. She paid those taxes every year, you know, so that, so that, and, and my, my generation, we didn't know nothing about this. We, we, we had left Tuskegee. We were in New York and, and Washington and Boston, you know, places like that, Atlanta. Fortunately, my grandmother had enough, enough notion about how this whole thing worked, that so, she paid those taxes and, 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 and she paid, you know, uh, kept that, and when she and 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 that land, and my grandfather left it on the air rights, and nobody could sell it. And to this day, in my, my it's the same way. And that that to me has been helpful with with my family. So so if I may, y'all, you know this this is a very important uh, issue here. And I'm gonna go back to what we said earlier. We need to stop talking about the problem and deal with the solution. There are uh, there are Africans with land. There are Africans with land in the South. There are yes. 200 acres of land in Beulah, and we can't get African people to come there and deal with it. Let me explain why. Because during slavery, we were forced to deal with the land for the man and not for us. So what happened was when our Gullah brothers and sisters came north, and it's a Gullah issue, and I'm not, I'm not gonna get, a, get too into it, but it's a Gullah issue. But they got Gullah people that understand the importance of land in North, in, in north America, but very few Africans are ready to go back into the soil. Because if you talk about land, you got to know how to go into the soil. I mean, you got to know how to grow food. People don't, people don't want to do it. People want to buy food. Single, I'm, single, I'm, single, huh? I'm sorry, brother. I'm sorry, I hate to interrupt you. But uh, I just got a call. One of my yes. great grandsons. No, one go of ahead. my great grandsons, this brother, is his fifth birthday. Brother and, Bailey, and brother Bailey, you excuse brother Bailey, please go ahead okay. and do that. You did indicate to me how much time you had. You got to okay. do what you got to do and you're on your phone. Please go Thank ahead. You, Thank you so much for being with us. But I'm, I'm going to I'm going to explore this situation. You're going to get the tape because I, okay. I, I'm, I'm going to lay this one out because this one is fiery for me because we got Thank more land. Than, we got more land than we can handle. We got land all in Africa. Yes, the land is being taken because we ain't dealing with the land. And I want to talk. I want to talk a little bit about people dealing with the land and All people right. who are interested in that issue. There Thank are you, Brother Peter Bailey. Thank you, Brother Peter Bailey. Uh, Thank you, Baba. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right. Okay. Take care, take care of yourselves. Thank okay, you. And peace and blessings, brother. And take care of yourselves. All right. Love you. We love you. Thank you. Yes. Mama Yab said a nice prayer for you. We pray that the ancestors continue to pour all their strength and energy into you, brother, so that you might be able to continue on in the work. This is important work that you are doing. And we thank you. And we want you to have continued life to finish up what, what you've started. Okay. Thank Good you, night, Baba. Good night. Good night. All right. I'll talk to you tomorrow, Brother Bailey. So you, it's very important, brothers and sisters, to understand that a lot of times there are brothers and sisters working on the solutions and, and, in, and with unity, you will get connected with brothers and sisters that are dealing with. As I say, in South Carolina, and not just South Carolina, but I could, I'm using that as an example, there are plenty of our brothers and sisters with land, 135 acres of land, 400 acres of land, and more. And they're looking for brothers and sisters that are serious about developing the land. So if you're ready to go south, you can. The Gullah Geechee people, some are dealing with land. Some have gotten away from the land because of what I told you earlier. Part of the problem is our people got away from de developing the land because out of the transatlantic slave trade, we didn't want to deal with it because we were not dealing with it for self. But now it's time to deal with it for self. But the major land is in Africa. 
I want you to hear that. The major land is in Africa. And if Africa land is not free, no Africans or no land anywhere is going to be free. So I'm going to stop on that because I kind of got sidetracked. But I want to make it clear. We got to stop complaining and to make and to come up with solutions. We got we got we got plans to do things in the UNIA. We also have other people and other entities that have plans of doing things. And what the biggest problem is the lack of consciousness and the lack of practical unity. The land, if it's been taken from us, and if we got to take it back, we need one military to do that. So these are these are solution solution issues. So yes, as the as the as the as the PG, the provincial government of Republic of New Africa says in the South, free the land. They ready. They got brothers and sisters there ready to free the land, but if they don't have the unity and the power and the economic development to do it, you ain't gonna be able to do it. They also have brother Abubakar down in Alabama now, who was our uh, uh, ambassador at one time, who is now in Alabama in Tuskegee, in fact, in, in, in another area. They're looking for brothers and sisters to come south that really wanna deal with the land, but it's not a piece of cake. You don't have no grocery stores on the corner. You got to learn how to grow your own food if you're in the land. So I want to say that, but I want to get back to my closing points, because it is important for us to understand our history and our roots and all other things will come into place when we do that, including our land. But the major land that we have that is undeveloped is Africa. Even though we are being exploited every day through neocolonialism, there's plenty of land in Africa. Plenty. And that's why everybody else is there. So when you talk about expatriating, think about purchasing land in Africa before you think about getting on a plane, because you can do that. And the UNIA is working with brothers and sisters that can put that in place for you. And so I want to get back to the Malcolm, Marcus, and, uh, and Woodson real quickly, because the next Freedom Friday, you're going to hear from me and the President General and probably some other brothers and sisters that are going to be laying out specific programs that we're doing. We also have some programs coming up. Adasi is doing a program toward the end of the month. And later on, we will make that announcement. Uh, the African Holistic Health Association is doing a program Monday and Tuesday. Me and Brother Heru, our technical director, will be doing presentations. So I'm just letting you know that this night, Freedom Friday, thanks to Division 330, is very important, but it don't stop there. We're going to continue to address how do we move towards solutions? We know the problems, how do we solve them? And one of the most important things that my brother Harua Foride has said to us is that every problem needs an engineering solution. So we need to put on our engineering hats, brothers and sisters. And if you just wanna be creative and rec make recommendations, let's recommend solutions. But certainly, he ain't gonna get it in the public schools. So we need Saturday schools, we need after school programs, we need home learning centers. Uh, Brother Imhotep has just instituted something in Baltimore on a Saturday level teaching young people. We've talked about it. We have our own institution within UNIA RSC 2020 and our president general has vowed that we are gonna go brick and mortar soon. But for right now, we are dealing with educating brothers and sisters however we can. Tonight is part of that. So I'm going to say, brothers and sisters, Dr. Woodson, Malcolm, and Garvey, our ancestors waiting and watching, but are in many of us. I saw some people on Facebook say, well, we, if Malcolm was here, we wouldn't be in this situation. Sure he would. Well, Malcolm is here now with us. Garvey is here now with us. Nanny Helen Burroughs is here with us now. The question becomes is when we are going to get busy doing it and to stop building somebody else's house and not building our own house. So I wanna appeal, my closing statements is to appeal to everybody listening to this, everybody in earshot. If you're African, you're already a member, but if you're a dues paying member, that means you're committed to the upkeep. Because when we talk about freedom, we ain't looking for it as Peter Bailey said next week. And as the president general said, when we talk about putting things in place, we're talking about the next hundred years. So we're putting structures together for brothers and sisters 
that are with us today and that come behind us to carry on and not get hoodwinked and divided by confusion and discontent and to get busy doing the work. So with I say, Ashe. 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 Ashe O. You, you have two hands up. Nana Malaya, Nana Malaya had her hand up. You have two hands up. So Nana Malaya, as uh, Sister Tendai, I'm going to make sure we recognize that. So I guess that's on you, Baba Mosey. Hey, blessings. Oh. Trying to get myself unmuted here. <laughs> okay. You're, well, you're, you're unmuted. unmuted. You're good. You're unmuted. All right. Blessings to everyone. We just can't see you, Nana Malaya. Oh, no, not right now. I'm literally just... <laughs> You're beautiful no matter how you look. Yeah, You'll but see my beautiful Facebook. face soon, but... <laughs> um, my question had to do with, if you're interested in the land first here, one is what are the steps and what are the plans? Because I myself would be interested, but I need to make certain steps before, one, I can move, and two, I have to admit, I'm a city girl. I don't know a whole lot about plants. So where <laughs> would we start in terms of preparing people? You know, you got to prepare folks in steps, you know? So what's the plan for that? Well, Nana Malaya, I will, I will send you some information so you can reach out to some of the brothers and sisters that I spoke about in South so you can be direct. Okay. Also, too, my family has land and the elders are growing and we also have um, I guess it's the air um, agreement. No one's allowed to sell it. Um, and at the same time, again, a lot of us are trying to look at how we want to uh, utilize it, okay? And it's about 50 acres, um, not too far. It's in Maryland. So I when, I, when I talk to these other people, I'd like to talk about some proposals being made so I can even maybe lay them out to my family because we're looking at the people who have some real plans and expertise on how to use the land. I, I think you, you're, and I, it's not, not my turn per se, but I think your situation is going to require us to kind of meet with you offline to offer okay. you some suggestions and you can contact Baba Mosey and of course Brother Singor and if they have the mind they can bring me in because what you're saying if I understood you correctly similar to what uh, Peter Bailey said you own land in the south and therefore how to secure it and move it forward and make it productive if I heard you correctly you, said you did Maryland, land in Maryland. Ma Maryland. That's, okay. that's that, still south. It's below that's still the, the south. Line. Yeah, I'm, it's still the south. <laughs> it may not be the south like we, I think Deep of Georgia south. south. Right. Yeah, right. but it's still south. Well, so well, 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 let me, let we me probably this. need so, to meet with you. And so, I'm not trying to so circumvent Baba Killy, that. Baba Killy, yes. so, so let me, let me, let me be clear uh, with Mama Malaya. Mama Malaya, I was talking about the shrine of the Black Madonna that has had land for many, many years. Okay. All right. So, and they have a plan, but you know, you, you, you know, each, each, each land mass or each home base would have to come up with its own collective plan. And so, 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 so it's important because the people who own the land are going to have to sit down and come up with a plan. Uh, of course, people can give you a proposal, but my, my view is that the people who actually own the land need to come up with the plans. Now, of course, uh, that's what I was talking about earlier. Of course, virgin land, the president general is absolutely correct. We'd have to deal with that offline, offline. But I was talking about people who already have stuff happening and are looking for people to be a part of it. And, so, and I think you should have that conversation yeah, I, with the sister. I will. Uh, yeah, I will, off, I will. Yeah, I'll, off your call. Well, yeah, yeah we will. We will. We will. We, not not only Leia's family up here. Yeah, so no, just have we, it we, off the call. We will. All right. Can I speak? Because I got my hand raised. I want to put my hand down. <laughs> okay, thank you all. Sure, all right. Leah. Okay, PG. My turn? Go right ahead. I'm going to lower my hand. Uh, I, I think tonight's program, for those who are listening and for the recording, made many suggestions. It cleared up some historical perspectives 
but at the same time, it formulized, strengthened historical perspective. The Honorable Marcus Messiah Gari put forth a plan. The Honorable El Haj Malik El Shabazz, as well as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, had pieces of that plan that they utilized. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad took it to the point of building a hospital and other economic entities that supported him and moved it forward because it was Islamic that created the problem that our community responded to because they thought Christianity was the only answer. Truly, no religious view is the only answer. However, the minister, Louis Farrakhan, also move the needle. So you say, Baba Kili, what about, no, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you those because the Honorable Stewart moved the needle, 1940. The Honorable Thomas W. Harvey moved the needle, 1950. The Honorable Charles L. James moved the needle. The Honorable Maddox moved the needle. The Honorable Battles moved the needle. The Honorable Marcus Garvey Jr. moved the needle. You say, Bama, you didn't say no women. No, but none of those men could have done it without the cadre that was built around them. And women were a part of that cadre. We in 2022, we're in the 20th century. We have time to garnish our history because we have sisters like Tindaye that give us that. We have sisters like Yao Love Joy to help us understand. We have young brothers, older brothers. We have within our working system the ability to create the network that will help us build the government that RC 2020 UNIAACL is committed to. Because they were out of government without a political entity that speaks to other political entities in the world, we don't fulfill Garvey's mission. And in 2022, on this call, any and all president generals, starting with me, that follow me, are committed to liberating Africa and the minds of African people and instilling within us the pride and the consciousness that is absolutely necessary for us to have a government and a nation and just a government. You got 55 governments, but we want a government and a nation. That is our mission. I suggest all join this mission because Africa is the answer to the world. And if they're the answer to the world, they damn sure I answer to. Thank you, brothers. Thank you very much. It's about that time. Uh, Baba Senghor, uh, do you have a last word? Or... Yeah, I just want to say, you know, we're blessed to have Brother A. Peter Bailey join us. But I, I want y'all to know a bro Brother A. Peter Bailey is constantly working. He served, he retired from serving as the president of Asala, you know, and Asala is the chapter of Whitson's organization here in Washington, DC. Uh, and for those who do not know, the Whitson Banneker, Jackson Bay Division carries the Whitson name, but many of us back in the 80s dealt with Asala, and I continue to deal with Asala to this day. Uh, this month is a very special month for Dr. Whitson's works, but it's not the only month all year long. And you've heard a lot tonight. We would strive, all of you on Facebook with all of your great comments, the comments for, Dr. for, for Sister Malaya. Sister Malaya, when you get a chance, you look at our Facebook page and you will see people giving you recommendations of different places. And as I stated before, we have everything we need except for us being together enjoined and sharing our resources. Everything we need, we have. We have people that know how to grow food in New York City on roofs. We have people who know that science. 
You can grow food here in Washington, D.C. in your yard. And when we start doing it, you know who's going to suffer the most? The corporations, the Safeways, the Giants, the Piggly Wigglies. But we're not there yet because we have not come into consciousness of knowing ourselves. And I'm not speaking about those of us on the call, on the Zoom. I'm speaking about the masses. And Brother ba P. Bailey, ba Peter Bailey made it clear. We need unity amongst, and the President General did. We need unity amongst the conscious community so we can set an example for the unconscious community and we can provide for the unconscious community so that they can become conscious. But brothers and sisters, I've been, I've been in the UNIA for a long time, but I was in the movement before I came in the UNIA. I was at the March on Washington, but it ain't about me, he or she, it's about we collectivity. We can do anything we want if we come together. And that is the critical question, coming together. And when we say come together, not just together at a party or at a movie or at a picnic, we're talking about coming together and rolling your sleeves up and working together. So Baba Mosi, I would be remiss if you didn't open it up to other people if they have any comments or expressions because we have quite a few people in the Zoom. I'm done. Okay. I think everybody has heard clearly from A.P. Okay. Peter Bailey and myself, but for sure, we ain't got time to mess around. It's time to get busy. All right. Well, those are the last words. Uh, we, we it's not, it's not nine o'clock yet, Bob. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I just had an important, uh, you know, like. Uh, oh, you got something to do. Yeah, okay, no, I got yeah. you. I got you. No problem. Okay. No so problem. I'm going to have to do this. Uh, so know. then if that was the last words, then I'll say to everybody, okay. thank you all for joining us. We say one God, one aim, one destiny. This will be continued. There um, is a Freedom Friday that comes up later. Baba and Moses, then, simple. Then, yes. And because Baba Moses said he got to like stop, he got a hard stop. He got four minutes so before you do what you were starting to do. I would like to say that all of those who are listening, all of those who are apart, you should be a part of you and I, ACLRC 2020. And the reason you should be a part of it is, is it doesn't matter what you may disagree with. We need to work through that so that we can be prepared to work with our people, our race. There isn't an example or attitude that we may have that is not an attitude that our people have. We can build the proper responses and solutions by airing them, working together to address them. People of African descent, stop being individuals and realize your opinion matters, your thought matters, even if we disagree. Because agreement comes from the discussion and the compromise within negotiations. And therefore, that allows us, the conscious people, to reach out to the unconscious Negro that has brought tooth and nail into the capitalistic oppressive system or the socialistic oppressive system of the European. Together, to, Marcus Garvey brought 20,000 people together from all across the world with different opinions and attitudes. They had one thing in common, race first. I don't care what we say, race first. So when they argued and they determined that they're addressing the Negro Bill of Rights, it was based on race first and the conditions that were exploited here on America first and in Africa second. People, Freedom Friday. So let me tell you in two, three, four words what that means to me. It means African people will be free seven days. Sante, Sante, brother. Sante. Okay, with that said, I'll say one God. One God. One aim. One, one aim. aim. And one destiny. Everybody be safe. One Thank destiny. You. Thank you. Destiny. Take it out, Harold. Thank you.